Now, very happy to welcome our next guest to the show. He has played 400 plus professional appearances at Man City, Sunderland, QPR, Real Salt Lake City as well. He has written his autobiography. It is called Kicking Back. Nedim Anua, it's great to have you on the show. You're very yeah. welcome. You're a bit young to be writing a book like this, but I suppose this is, uh, <laughs> this is the way of football. <laughs> yeah, it, you know, it's weird when like you put up the picture of me to me, like I'm looking at myself, it's like, oh, this is weird. Like, I'm gonna talk about me again. Like I, I try and be, I try and talk about others and talk about everything else but myself. But now here we are with a book and I've clearly got to talk about it. So yeah, it's, uh, it's good. And I'm not too young because I think you'd be too young if you were still playing and you were writing a book at that point, like that feels too young. But when you're retired, you know, I'm the same as a 65 year old, would you not say? You know, No, it's I'm true, retired. you're, just you're like a pensioner that. in the world of football. Yeah, exactly, yeah. my friend, exactly. So a uh, couple of things. You do a really um, interesting thing in the uh, forward of sorts is that you ask Mika Richards and Joe Hart, two yeah. former teammates, two friends, to mm. talk about you. Yeah. It's kind of a brave thing to do. What are they going to say? So yeah. uh, certainly a theme right across the book, Mika Richards is blown away by your intelligence. Mm. Whereas Joe Hart says, and I like this, He's a special character, special guy, but he does love the sound of his own voice and he pretends he doesn't. <laughs> um, I wouldn't say I love the sound of my own voice, but I do like having conversations. So by effect, I guess that means that I do like liking to talk. Maybe that means that you do like your own voice. Like I have, I have opinions I've, and I like playing devil's advocate with people. So that makes a lot of com short conversations don't really exist when, I, when I'm talking with people. So, you know, he can say that and that, that's fair enough, but it's not what's the, what's the harm in being thoughtful and, you know, being able to have a conversation with someone instead of saying like, you know, the how are you as you walk away? Like I say, how are you? And I stand there waiting for the answer and that answer then dictates what we do next. Like, I don't love the sound of my own voice. I've heard some people like the sound of my voice. I just like to talk and what's, what's the harm in that? Do you depart football with many friends, actual friends? Um... <clears throat> Do you know if I was to do like a proper head count, I'd probably say 20 to 30 people who I'll probably speak to for the rest of my life who I deem to be close to me. And I don't know if that seems like a lot to people or not, because I did play for 16 years and I saw a lot of people along the way. But it's not to say that if you're not part of that 20, then, you know, you're an enemy of mine because it's not the case. But it's as, as is the case with people who go to work and so on. There are people you get along with and you work in a work environment. There are people who like when you leave work, you'll see outside of it. And there are some people who say throughout my career, I'm talking like Fraser Campbell, Joe Hartz and the like, Michael Richards, to name but three, Junior Hoyler as well. Like I, can name, I can obviously name more. And I always click with them from the get-go because it wasn't just about football. You know, we don't always talk about football. In fact, we rarely do. So when you don't talk about football, you know that when football stops and that's the thing you have in common, you've still got other things in common. Whereas I think for other people, like it's kind of one-dimensional we are here, we love the game, this is what. This is who we are, this is what we do, and everything revolves around that. Yet instead with these guys, like some of the people I've named there, like our kids play together, you know, our wives, uh, friends, you know, we've been on holidays together, and within all that, we've not had to talk about any Premier League games coming, Championship games coming, or anything like that. So, yeah, they're the people I can live a normal life with, and now the moment's come where, you know, the people I've picked, it turned out to be good decisions in the end. Have you watched on with a certain bemusement as Mika has taken over the world of punditry? Well, I was actually, um, I was in the USA for, from 2018 to 2020. And that was when like the rise started to happen. And because I was over there, I didn't really see it on a day-to-day -day basis, but people would tell me about, oh, Mika's, Mika's a guy now, you know? I was like, does he? Like, what do you mean? <laughs> and then I came back and it's like, okay, so I'm watching a game on Sky. Mika's doing the, uh, the studio stuff. Goes to an ad break. Mika's doing the advert. Um, then back to the game, Micah's talking, finishes in there, right? Okay, match of the day's on tonight. Who's on? Oh, Micah's on. Okay, so then on on, on Monday, I see the nighttime review. Oh, Micah's on BBC. Oh, right, okay, cool. Well, what about on just like a non-footballing channel like Sky? What? Oh, Micah's on that as well. I thought, ah, fair enough. This guy, he's, he's doing his thing. And, you know, credit to him, like, he wants to do it. And it's good to see someone like him on there because he's a good guy. And I think the more good guys that we see winning, the more sort of hope we have for society because it means that not every villain is going to be taking up every role that other people maybe deserve. So I'm not too sure where to start with this book because there's so much in it. I mean, we might, if you don't mind, uh, touching your parents and their experience yeah. at the outset because it's uh, a road less traveled, I suppose. And yeah. and they seem like, I mean, I know your, your, your mother passed away very sadly and you, you talk about that in the book, but 
Uh, they do seem like extraordinary people in so many ways, arriving into Manchester, you know, starting from bottom up and your father going mm. to University of York and Manchester Metropolitan University and, and becoming a maths teacher and your mother, Dr. Antonia Onua, PhD, mm. and uh, both uh, determined that their children would have the very best possible education. Your father was in Royal Mail sorting office at night and then he was a teacher by day mm. so that you and your sisters could go to private school. Now, mm. if life is about luck, parents like that make you quite lucky. Yeah, I would I would totally agree. And only now in having three kids and seeing the amount of time and money that it costs to raise them, do I really, really appreciate the fact that they raised four in the way that they did because I'm coming from a far more privileged position than they did when they first did it because they were coming over to a new country, didn't understand how everything worked, couldn't get the jobs that they deserved and stuff like that, but they did their absolute best and it cost them, you know, whether it was health and, you know, just financially and stuff like that. So they were looking back, they were very good. Like, I think everyone believes they're a good person, but I believe I'm a good person. And I think a lot of that's come from the way that I was raised in that time because it wasn't as simple as say just being a kid that was raised in Manchester like I was a kid that was being raised in Manchester through very significant Nigerian traditions for a lot of that time so I saw things in a different manner but still felt things externally which they didn't feel when they were growing up so I think I've got the best of both like the book is a lot about identity and alike and I feel like I'm I home for me for example as a concept when you have the name that I do home is always Nigeria because there'll be more people like me there than there are anywhere else in the world but then home is also getting off a flight and arriving back in Manchester and knowing that I could basically close my eyes and walk back to my house and know exactly where I'm at every single point with my eyes closed because I'm so familiar with that as well. So they did very, very well for me, for my sisters, gave us the best possible chance that we can. It's not to say that, you know, we're all incredibly successful because of it, because we had to do things ourselves. But I think some of the ideas that they sort of put into us and you saw the effort that they put in as well. It makes you want to work hard. It makes you want to do them proud. And as you get older, as I say, you realize like how much they were actually doing. And yeah, it's, I'm very, I'm very lucky. You know, I'm a family first type of guy and lots of people are as well, but you know, I'll, I'll never change that. And I remember everything that they did and there's, I, there's not enough time left for me on this planet to be able to say to them, you know, in the end, this will be me paying you back because there's, there was just so much of it when I was younger. You write in the book about your early experiences in 1990s. Manchester mm. Mm. it's um it was a different place it was a different place like Manchester today like it's it's thriving you know you could argue there's a bit of like gentrification within certain areas and things like that but it's a nice place where people want to go and it's people of all different ages races sexes everything like it's a very much Bolton type place but in the early 90s where I was living it certainly was not that like we were the only black family in that neighborhood and we were kind of treated as such you know, we, it's not like everyone's together and these are the families that know they're different and we were treated as we were different. And in the area we lived in, it wasn't like, it wasn't a place that was riddled with like gang crime or anything like that. But from a socioeconomic standpoint, it was very low down in terms of what Manchester is. So there was a lot of like poverty and people in those sorts of areas, there's desperation. People were breaking into our house and stuff like that. But it was my neighbors that were doing it. You know, people were lighting my parents cars on fire and all this stuff and as you're in a new country like thankfully I look at my daughter now my oldest daughter and she's eight look at my second daughter she's turned five and I think well I was five when I first came over to the UK so a lot of the things which I saw then didn't have the same sort of impacts as it would have if I was a little bit older because for a lot of it back then was it was bad and don't get me wrong you know I still loved going to school making my friends and so on but to say that it's the same place today as it was then would be would be a massive lie, but I suppose that's what we could say about most places. Mm. What effect, if any, do you think that experience had on you? Um, it's a good question. I think there's no right or wrong way to live, but I think sometimes with certain people, like I've seen, I've seen it here. Wherever you are in terms of the hierarchy socioeconomic or socioeconomic situation and so on someone that's like middle to the top to the top or somebody's got had a silver spoon in their mouth from the get-go they believe that like that's the only way to be and that's the only way to think but now in a position whereby i've earned money and i'm in a different category i still remember the roots and what it's like to have not had anything so every day that i live and every decision i make isn't made with a sort of careless disregard of like 
where I've come from. You know, journeys do matter. And in the same way, people who have no money don't understand how rich people work. People, rich people tend not to know how people with no money work. But I think I've experienced all the different stages of that. And I, it means that I'm grounded. It means I understand the value of every pound. Like I can afford things, but I'm always thinking about the price. I'm always, always thinking about it. And it's, like, I don't know if that's a gift or a curse, but it matters. And you think about the consequence of each thing. And I suppose for somebody who's trying to do the best for themselves, for their family, for the generations to come, like that sort of grounding I had from that point, you know, it's good. And then to add to that, like, because I've not had perfect experiences throughout, like I really appreciate the good ones. I really, mm-hmm. really appreciate them. But I understand that some of those good ones aren't necessarily um, as real as you would like them to be because there's something else that's always going on if you pay attention. You're open in the book about starting off on your 80 pounds a week and mm. being very sensible with your money and man, I've saved a thousand pounds for the first time. And Incredible, rich. incredible moment. Yeah, think of filthy it. rich, filthy rich I was. I think, think of what I can do in Pizza Hut with all this exactly, money. Exactly, my friend. Yeah, exactly. And then you, you keep going and you're, you remain very open and it's, you know, suddenly we get to a point where you're earning a million for the first time in a given mm. year, which by the way, could have been a lot more, but you were satisfied with that with the time and on it goes uh, that experience of of suddenly earning all of this money at such a young age and and, and being financially secure and um, yeah. you know that can have profound effects on uh, different people a touch surreal as well well it must be an amazing thing to stick in your old debit card and check yeah. balance and see seven oh. figures and think oh my god how is this real yeah exactly and you do do that as well by the way like when you first start getting paid really well like you, you always look, see, like this is actually happening. Because I remember I did that when I was getting eight pounds a week. Like every Friday, as soon as it kick in, I'd look and be like, yes. And even then, if we'd won a reserve game, like we'd get 20 pounds from that as well. So on a good week, I'm making a hundred pounds a week. Like I'm king of Manchester with this type of money. So I think when you when I look back and think about all those stages when money starts coming in, like the growth, it it's like it's steep. You know, there's not a gradual increase of money because you go from being like, you realize the stages of being like a youth team player to being a professional, to be like a first team starting professional. It's like three different worlds where the sort of the expectation around what you do and the amount of money you get paid for doing it. It's just so vast. So the quicker you go through those stages, the more that sort of increase can be like mind blowing. But at the end of the day, like, there are people like me, lots of people like me, who like never in their mind thought they could spend all the money that were being given anyway, whether it's hundred pounds a week or a hundred thousand pounds a week. But then there are other people who want to spend every single penny of it throughout the entire journey. And it's not to say one way's right, one way's wrong. But with football, as I realized in the second half of my career, you never know when your last year is going to be. You never know when your last contract's going to be. So some of those decisions you made from earlier, like what you sort of feel the real consequences of them towards the end and being at uh, Queens Park Rangers at 25, 26 and looking around and seeing like 32, 33 year old type players around me, they were all planning for the end. And some of those were horror stories and some of those were positive stories. But for me, it made me think, well, I need to get ready for that that point, even though at that stage I was only halfway through my career. Mm. You were at Man City from the age of 10. Mm. You were a striker until the age of 16. They converted you to a defender. And things happened fast and early for you. Kevin Keegan yeah. in 03 brings you into the first team squad. You talk about Ali Benarbia playing a through ball to an Elka. And you say at the time, I had no idea how he did it. I didn't yeah. see it coming. I didn't yeah. see where it was going. It went yeah. to an Elka. Different level. And you'd been yeah. full-time a year. But you make your debut at 17. And in a League Cup a few days later, Norwich Monday off the bench for Richard Dunn. Mm. So you were up and running early. Yes, I was up and running very early. And so early to the fact that I, um, so for my, the first squad I was involved in was a home game against Chelsea. And I think it was the only game Chelsea lost in 2004 because Nicholas and, El- Nicholas and Elka scored a penalty to win. And I was, um, I was at college when I got the call to say, what number do you want? You know, if you want to talk about like a, a sudden moment of madness like I was literally just at college I said what number do you want and I said I don't know the next thing I'm number 16 and two days later I'm sitting on the bench and Mourinho's like on the other bench and this is like Chelsea football club who as I say lost one game all season and I'm just like there potentially about to play in it but I was just in the like the canteen cafeteria area two days earlier just talking to students and I had my student card my NUS card all that stuff so 
the rise can be it can be truly remarkable i think once you come in full time at 16 anything goes because i remember at 16 i was playing for the under 17s and everyone said oh you've made it when you play for the under 19s then if you play for the 90s you made it when you play for the reserves but at that time the two training grounds were separate so the academy training ground and the reserve first team training ground were separate so then it's like well if you make it to that training ground then anything goes because at that point you'd be a supp supplementary player. So they might bring you across on Fridays to do set pieces and stuff and be one of them, basically just be a mannequin or just like a whipping boy for them working on whatever they're working on. But it's far easier to impress someone when you're right in front of them, as opposed to when you're at the other training ground and people are telling you how well you're doing or they're coming to watch you on a, like a Saturday morning or something because you've got an academy game. So it does happen very quickly, but that's the nature of football, isn't it? Like you can go from being the bottom ranked person to opportunity putting you in at number one, just out the blue. And I've seen so many players start their careers just like that. And I was no different. The other thing which is so precarious and changeable, of course, is managers. And yep. you play under 11 managers, I think you say. Yeah, just, just the 11, yeah. English football, years. yeah. So Keegan, you like, and he's got a philosophy of football and he brings you into the team. So, you know, good memories there. And then next, for instance, is Stuart Pierce, And this is probably a period at Man City people can remember uh, quite well because the club was beginning to change. Mm. so much because it is really interesting reading the book I, I do scratch my head a touch at man management or at the yeah. quality of management in this multi-billion pound industry and mm. you know Pierce for instance something which really sticks in your head is in January in 06 you get a bang to your knee someone falls on your knee and it turns out you've ruptured your medial ligament but yeah Stuart Pierce says you'll be fine get up get up yeah. and you weren't one to stay on the ground necessarily. No. And so you find yourself uh, just absolutely furious. And, and just yeah. these kind of, yeah. I'm sure that's happening on training grounds up and down yeah. the country all the time. Yeah, 100%. And the man management thing is like, it can be such a key attribute because if you're a good man manager, then you don't need to be the best coach mm. because it means that the players will always work their hardest for you. And even though you can't create a perfect plan, an okay plan can become a good one. But when you're a good coach, but you're a poor man manager, that good plan falls off because you can't get the buy-in because there's people are doing it. Like this is probably the same across all sorts of like workforces and alike. Mm -hmm. If you like, you want, even when things are going wrong, you can be doing everything you can for your teammates, for your manager, for the football club, because it's a great environment. It's a great place to be. But when you're like, there've been times in my career where I'm arriving at the stadium, arriving, arriving at the training ground, and it's like, I'm here at work. Like going to playing football shouldn't really ever have to feel like work because there's something different about it. But depending on the environment that's set by the coaching staff and by say the club in general, I think it certainly can feel like that because it should be joy. Like people play football because they love it. Play football because they love to win, to be with teammates, to be with friends, to be competing against other sides. And to play a game which you sort of feel is sort of fair because it's 11 versus 11 and whatever situation. So that man management side, like I'd never, like I, that Stuart Pierce thing, like I'll never forget that because I remember the pain I was feeling at the time. And I thought he's completely got me, misjudged me here and completely got this wrong. And it's happened a couple of times, happened with Harry Redknapp when I was at QPR as well. Happened, I think, with Mancini at City. And like I pride, as is the case for everyone, like you take pride in who you are. So when somebody basically accuses you of being something else and treats you as such hmm. like you're not just going to forget about that and then that's when the sort of not grudges and stuff happen but you know when they're talking you're not listening to the same sort of intent as you would do if it's somebody that you really really sort of like buy into and I think I've, there've been tons of managers who I've seen like that where they just can't captivate the room like when you for example when you go and sit in a video room on a Friday before a game on a Saturday there's some managers who know that like players lose interest quite quickly so they're entertaining they've got charm they're getting people involved in all this and then the other ones where like people they not where people are only in there because they have to be and they don't want to be because if this but if you don't turn up this person's going to like ban you from the training ground and stuff like that so you know it's not to say authoritarians don't work but an authoritarian with like a bit of charisma might bring success pierce was uh, replaced by sven and further to your point even as that unraveled a touch and finished with an 8-1 defeat. Yeah. You, talk, you described Richard Dunn gathering all the players in the dressing room and thanking Sven for what he had done. And you said that he never, ever, ever lost the dressing room. And he had a way of, and this is a, you know, this is definitely a theme throughout your 
your story where you're in and out of the team at mm. times. But Sven had a way of keeping the fringe players happy as well and feeling involved and feeling yep. part of it. And, and, you know, it struck me reading it by, by, by contrast to Mancini, who we might come on to. I, 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 what good but also sensible management to keep the group happy. And to, like yeah. if, you ha- if you have a couple of individuals who aren't happy and they're there every day, that's just not going to lend itself to a good atmosphere. But while the old Sven seemed to yeah. think Sven, beyond. Yeah, Sven, Sven was very good with that. And I think with Mancini, perhaps he's different now because like, watching them at the Euros last year, it seemed like everybody was like in the mix. And I think that was down to bringing in some of the ex players like De Rossi or ex-international yeah. players like De Rossi and the like. So that was the identity. That was the character. This is the overall Italian way and everybody's involved because as a player, you'd see De Rossi, and be like, oh, it's De Rossi, you know, yeah. that sort of Viali. thing. Exactly. Like it makes sense. But from when he was at City, he had his way in terms of how he wanted you to train, how he wanted you to play. And that's all that was important to him. All the other stuff, like he wouldn't try and charm you to get the most out of you. He just, dem- he just demanded the most out of you. And that's what it was. And that's fair. Like some people, Enjoy that, get off with that. But my football's not always good. So when things are bad, like, what's he like? Like, this is the same guy who, like, in a period of time said, I think when Yaya Torre wasn't playing, he said to those players, you guys are nothing without Yaya. But that would make sense if Yaya was there when I was playing. But he's talking about David Silva's Vincent companies, you know what I mean? Joe Hart's joining the Lescott's to name but a few. Like, mm-hmm. Carlos Tevez, Sergio Aguero, you know, that's a wild thing to say. <laughs> Literally insane. But for, but for Sven, like something else, which I think he got really well, he did well, was at some stage within the season, you know who you are as a player and where you fit in with any particular team. And for a lot of people, that's not as a regular starter. But with Sven and other managers, which I had, it wouldn't be a case of when Monday comes or Tuesday comes, the coach pulls over a starting 11 and then the other team just have to wait whilst the starting 11 do their session. And then when they're ready, we then come together and we work on stuff for them. And it's a game where if you're in the second 11, say the starting 11 are attacking you and you win the ball back. Sometimes I've had managers who just blow the whistle and let the starting team get the ball again to start an attack and stuff like this. Oh, come on. Like you're thinking, ah, this is, this is, or like when, like, you know, you want to be, you want to help. But then in the same breath where it says, right, you guys, uh, B team, you're going to play like Stoke now. So just take long throws and they're rejigging people and you're gaining nothing in terms of you as a developing player or anything like that. You know, that stuff's tough. But with someone like Roberto, like he was very much driven around the starting 11 and maybe one or two players who we might switch before Friday in terms of deciding who it was going to be. But for Sven, everyone was involved and it was never just a case of the starting 11 do this and you guys over there, like you used to get called Deadwood. Like, yeah, you guys just focus on that because at the end of the day, you don't matter. It's like an exercise in demoralizing you. Yeah, it's it's oh, it's hot, it's horrid. It's absolutely horrid, especially when, like, because you always want to be in the starting eleven and know that you can play well, play badly, but you get another opportunity. Mm. But as the squads grew, there'd then be a group of players from maybe maybe eight players plus who know they're not playing on a week to week basis. So it's like, who are we going to be this week? Oh yeah, you be the lap. Mm. Oh yeah, you be this guy, and then you just they're waiting right. Like, do the warm up, whistle goes. Manu says, I want this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy. They all go to the side. And you're just there, just like, all right, okay. Just whenever you need me to work on this long throw or practice this long ball for you to defend against or anything like this. Like, it's mm-hmm. a tough spot to be in, but it's the nature of football sometimes, unfortunately. Excuse my slightly long winded point here. So, just to continue a potted history of your career, uh, there's this fan period, and then Mark Hughes comes in, and, and you're making your way in the game. A few too many injuries, perhaps, and some kid called Richards also <laughs> emerges. And, and so you're good buddies, but you're also vying for the same position. Yep. And you remember watching Sky Sports News in 2008 when Mark Hughes, who'd been on the golf course that morning, only to be told we've signed Rubinio for 32 million quid. Abu Dhabi have arrived at this stage and then suddenly he's holding a Rubinio jersey and on Sky Sports News. Even in that summer transfer window alone, Zabaleta arrives. That's more bad news. Vincent Company arrives. Sean Wright Phillips returns, a uh, yeah. real mentor to you and, and a very positive mm-hmm. uh, presence. Then the following January, Nigel De Jong, Wayne Bridge, Shea Given, Bellamy, uh-huh. really good players. And then the following summer, the summer of 09, Gareth Barry, Rocca Santa Cruz, Tevez, Adebayor, Colo Torre, Jolien Lescott. So this is a touch insane, this period. Now, to be fair, you get to January 09, you've only started two games. Yeah. But then you start 24, 
in the second half yeah in the second half and and, and you get into a nice uh, rhythm and things are going well but this this period where Man City transformed, we all remember it. I mean, this is like, um, yeah. I feel like I'm watching football in years here as these names are being, yeah, yeah, Roque yeah. Santa Cruz, you know, I'm getting uh, flashbacks. So uh, your memory of that period where all of these players coming in and, and the club that you've been at since a boy changing so dramatically? Um, to talk about the bit about players coming in, um, so player turnover was was quite a thing at that time at City because the year before that takeover happened, we had the first takeover with Texan Chinawatra, which ended up being a failed takeover. Well, not a failed takeover, but like a failed experience because we thought we were on the road then. And that summer, actually, they sat when they got Sven. They also got veteran Choluka, who could play centre-back or right-back. I was like, ah, well, me as a centre-back or right-back... Hmm. Um, it's not really it's not really ideal is it so you know i had lots of years of that where people were being brought in and i was always optimistic i'd say i was always optimistic because for the people coming in my mentality was they were coming in to try and make the club better but i'm still here and i've not been sold and nobody's asked me to leave and if i didn't start the season like fair enough for the new signing to get the opportunity to play but i always seem to end the season or have really significant spells within it it was disappointing, you know, when you're waiting around for a chance. But, like, I always seem to take the chance. And due to the ebb and flow of the season, like, the opportunity would come and you see just see how you play. Like, I think this, my first season, 04, 05, or might be the second second season, actually, uh, Danny Mills was playing. So this is an England international right back. So I'm thinking, well, I'm obviously not going to be playing. But then come the end of the season, I played in every all of the last 10 games of the season where I think we went unbeaten and nearly qualified for the UEFA Cup. So... Change happens, and I think for City, one of the biggest changes was the moment the new, the current ownership came in. It was a case of the people you linked with, the names start to change a little bit. Uh, from back in the day, you're looking at people from certain clubs, certain points in their career, but then it's like, well, they're looking for this guy, for that guy. And in fairness, like when you talk about Zavaleta's companies, so on and so forth, like they were the right signings for that particular moment. And they, apart from Robinho, realistically, they all made sense throughout that stretch. So the quality of play was changing. They were getting younger. They were getting better. Now there's a few internationals coming in and this. And you, you dis you're disappointed because you think, well, this guy coming in means that they're going to be playing. But in some ways, that made me a better player because training then got better. So even if I wasn't playing for those five days, I had to compete at a higher standard mm. to think that I have the opportunity to be able to play on a Saturday. So when sometimes, you know, we have these debates about should a youngster just go out on loan and this, that, and the other, well, I think it depends on the nature of the club he's going to go on loan to and the nature of the club that he's at currently because he might not necessarily get the same sort of game time, but he's getting some, like, valuable experiences. So I, um, it's, it's ironic. The most games I played for City was the season after they got all the money. That's my one season. I think mm -hmm. that's insane. I've got, like, Player of the Month awards for, like, two out of the last three months of the season from that from that time and you know this is when we were in the UEFA Cup this is when we had Robinho you know we had Alados we had the works like the team was was nice yeah and that's when I shone the most so just just a case of you know whilst you're there you never know like if you give up because somebody's coming in like what's the point like mm. put your ego to the side for a second and understand that this person coming in isn't guaranteed to be playing ahead of you because at the end of the day if you end up being better than them then why would they um and then for just the club changing overall it was, um, I knew, so after the Shinawatra takeover, you know, we we're very hopeful, but we finished like seven for eight from the league. And it was a bad second half of the season. But Sven was there, which was surreal because that's the England manager, Sven, you know, that guy. Really good, tried, tried a nice style of football, had some good players in. And then the next year, I was like semi-skeptical when the ownership came in because they said they wanted to win, they said they wanted to do that. But as is the case of anybody of our sort of generation born in the 80s, like, just because City say they're going to win a league or their ambition is to win a league or to win a cup competition doesn't make it so because there's United, there's Liverpool, there's Chelsea, there's Arsenal, there's Spurs, whoever, like all these other teams still do exist. So you have money, but like, so what? You know, Chelsea, when they were taken over, Chelsea still had a recent significant history in terms of European competition, domestic competition as such. As a City, we didn't have that. Like we didn't, we didn't have a Manchester derby every year from when the Premier League started because we spent multiple years outside of the Premier League. You know, I think some people forget that. Um, so when he said, this is what it's going to be, I was like, yeah, okay. And then one international break. Um, I didn't get called up for England on 21. So I was there for the week training. But the training ground we had, 
they've just built a new space inside it in 10 days. Mm. It's one of the most like incredible. It's like, you know, when you see those like makeover shows on TV or something, it was insane because it's a big old training ground and everything changed. People mm. must have gone away and they came back as like, oh, mm. right. So this is the new training ground. I went, all right. So they've got the infrastructure. And then little by little, the type of play they were bringing in, the mentalities that were coming in. And then when Mancini came in, to be fair, he was a manager who expected success. And that there then started to sort of trickle down through the club. And before you know it, there was a point where in 2008, we won against Man United at Old Trafford. That was the first time in 34 years. And now you look at City and people go to Old Trafford expecting to win. You know, that change in mentality was when I was seeing that, like, this place is for real because there's nobody that's jaded about Manchester derbies. It's just people get excited because there's a chance to get three points at Old Trafford. So Mancini's first season, you've got your couple of player of the months awards. Uh, and now that was that was Mark Hughes. So it's 2009. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, Mancini arrives. You've got, you, you've got your player of the month awards in your back pocket. You're kind of optimistic about the future and you're getting some treatment on your calf. And Mancini, after his initial meeting, comes over and asks you, yeah. Uh, when are you back? And you kind of crack, I suppose, it's trying to show a bit of personality, crack a joke, yeah. you smile and you nod to the physio and you say, don't know, it depends what this guy kind of says. Yeah. And uh, your joke goes down like total yeah. lead balloon. He yeah. looks at you and your senses, he almost, to an extent, made his mind up about you even from that first encounter. It definitely did not help. You know, when, I'll be honest, like, I thought that was good material. You know, I generally thought that was good material. That's it's, like, it's, that's, it's, that's it's, standard football humor. It's you know okay. I mean? Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, I thought it was good anyway. Okay. But like the, the physios involved, you know, he's having a joke as well. Like, yeah, sure. You're bringing everyone in. Yeah. A, a player is injured. How long's a player out for? Well, he just got injured two days ago. And it's a grade two thing, which is like a medium level type injury. The player's clearly not going to be training today or next week or whatever. So I can't put a time frame on it, but one thing that people knew when I was injured, like I worked very hard to come back, like exceptionally hard. There's no slacking at all. Mm. Um, but he just wasn't, just wasn't having it. Just literally wasn't having it at all. And I think looking back, like that was the only time I think when a new manager came in where I wasn't available in that moment, because then you realize the importance of first impressions. And that's some of those first impressions of stuff on the field. I know people who you must you must have watched the club beforehand and so on, but he immediately starts to think about who he trusts and who he doesn't. And there's a group of us who just couldn't care any less about. And when I then came back to train, it wasn't like he was greeted with a pat on the back or anything like that. It's just like oh, here he is. I remember that, this guy. That period in, in the in the book stands out the most for me of any because it's you you you've you've been doing so well and you're so obviously hardworking, diligent type and and willing to work on your game and then oof. Like being out in the cold at a football club yeah. is absolutely horrendous. And and it comes across, there are, there are so many stories you tell right the way through. I mean, even Upton Park, where you're waiting to see if you're even in the subs and it's yeah. like, it's the page put up last and then they forgot to even write the subs down. Yeah. And then it's like, so, well, who's the subs? And then you're not a sub and you start bringing like your gloves and hat to games because you know you're going to be in the stands. Yeah. And you're just really, really miserable. I can see how like your mental health would just be on the floor. Yeah. Um. That's one hundred percent right. And for me personally, about that time, it's being out in the cold at the place I called home. You know, if it happened at the other clubs I was at, then immediately I'd just be thinking, "Well, it didn't work out. It's just time to move on to the next thing." But that's all I'd ever known. The club was all I'd ever known. The only club I'd ever played for. The only club I ever wanted to play for. I'd literally like think of as fans of the game. If you played for your club, would you be ever thinking about leaving anywhere? Some of these conversations we have, like about like blind faith and loyalty and stuff like this. Like that's, I was drinking that Kool-Aid. Like I had no desire to play anywhere else for anybody else, regardless of however that team was doing. And then all of a sudden, like I'm out, but I'm out amongst the same bunch of players who I was previously in with. And I don't know how to get out of this situation because there's no feedback being given. I'm just out. And it's a massive shock to the system. And in that time, it's obviously a bit different to today. And some of the conversations about mental health and the like aren't really there. But also, I don't think anybody at the club really had a stable footing with the new management because they were all concerned about like what happens to them if the manager doesn't like them. They're on the way out as well. So I was very much isolated within an industry which doesn't, which at the time wasn't going around asking everybody, are you okay? Are you okay? You just had to suck it up and get on with it. And, you know, there's still that mentality going on now. But like, I really needed someone. And I think um, 
the player I was for the last five, six years of my career, which is more of like a senior figure and captain type. Like I needed that type of person back then who would see that a team goes beyond just the starting 11 and goes to the actual group of 25. But unfortunately, that wasn't the case. No, and it does because you're not the first player who, who has spoken about a fairly joyless experience under R- Roberto Mancini. I mean, that's that's generally been the consensus, to be honest. And it always initially was quite surprising because in front of the media, oh, he would be very quick to smile and oh, magnificent, <laughs> and my friend. Yeah, magnificent in front of the media, and yet you like you you talk about a few other instances where like just even getting a smile out of him is impossible or. Yeah. Uh, you there was a free kick and you were in a certain position and he said you're in the wrong position you pointed out well actually i was in the right position craig bellamy was meant yeah. to be there and yeah. he you used the word he hissed and he said yeah. don't ever speak back to me yeah and and, and this this coldness yeah was very at odds with roberto talking to them yeah exactly roberto would be tossing his hair and had his scarf on you know like the scarf on in march april time in manchester you know this is roberto like yeah. good looking guy you know what i mean ladies loved him and then as soon as the cameras stopped rolling, he went back to the dressing room. Oh, they the like the stereotypical like Italian gestures were coming out at you every time you made a bad pass or a bad decision. And he wasn't really like he was never really pumping you up to the point whereby you could run through a brick wall for him. But you knew that if you didn't run through said brick wall, you wouldn't get the chance to again. You know, that's the that's the irony of that situation. But he um yeah, that free kick situation was like it was insane because we were 4 0 up away from home in the Premier League. Like, talk about abnormal situations to be in. So you think, ah, oh, what a dressing room that would be at half time. But instead, it was like semi hostile because he was really angry with me. And I thought, it's like, it's nil. It's like literally 4 0 away at a place where there's no guarantee that's going to be the case. But just goes to show, like, certain people are liked more than others. And for him, like, the standard was so high in terms of his mentality that 4-0 away from home wasn't enough to just sort of like just crack on. And instead, the thing that annoyed him the most, or the, the key thing at half time, was somebody not being in the right place from a set piece in the 44th minute. Because, you know, if they would have scored then, then the comeback's on, isn't it? Obviously. But I don't know. He, I, I didn't understand him then. I think I'd like to see him in the future to be able to speak to him and really figure out what's going on, see how much he's changed. But back then, I'll be honest, like, that's the type of thing that just made me just hate him even more. And I was not the only person because it just felt unfair in a moment which we could have enjoyed. Instead, I'm very much on the back foot. And from then, I didn't really play again. Do you, I mean, because ultimately things were successful or he could claim they were. You, he wins an FA Cup. He follows that up with the Premier League win. And so he, he, he may well argue, well, having every everybody a bit on edge and a bit miserable and never being satisfied. Look at the career I've had as a manager. Yeah. My methods are vindicated, therefore. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's, he's very successful. Like, I, I'm not I'm not out there to do a hit job against him. Like, he changed Man City for the better because they became a very successful side. City winning the FA Cup in 2011, that's not normal. City winning the Premier League in 2012, like, that's within two, three years of the takeover at a point where then they weren't spending £100 million on players. You know, it was a different spot. They had money, but it was different and the players they were bringing in weren't people who were guaranteed to bring success as well. I think the way he coached the team in terms of style of play, like he was very good at that. Like to this day, I play football once a week and it's sometimes five aside, occasionally it's 11 aside. And there's stuff I do in these games, which he taught me, like he scarred me so much and we did it so much that subconsciously, like I just do it. When the ball goes here, I'm like standing in this position. I'm like, how did I get here? Oh, yes, because I did that every day for six months and literally had no choice in the matter. So he was like, what more could you ask for from a coach? But unfortunately, he was distinctly lacking as a person. But from a coaching standpoint, like I think for me, the best coaches are the ones, as in I'm saying coaches specifically, are the ones who get teams to play exactly how they want them to according to their vision. And it might be successful, it might not be, but they're a good coach and their brand of football is something they should stick with because that's what will get them hired in the next place. But some of the worst ones for me who just come in and the team doesn't really have any true style, any true identity, and they're almost going with the flow where if you hear something in the media saying the team's a bit weak, then they'll try and get them strong for a week or if they're a bit bad at set pieces, they'll work on set pieces for a week and they're very reactive to criticisms as opposed to just disregarding those and saying, this is who we are, this is how we play. Because then every time you play for them, you know exactly what you need to do. And you might not enjoy it, 
if they say everyone's got to balance on one leg for 45 minutes at a time, but if they get you doing it, then surely that's a success from a, from a managerial standpoint. So 2012, you depart Manchester City. You'd been there since you were 10. You make yep. your debut at 17. And, and certain managers there, and timing is everything, certain managers were, were right behind you. And then there's Mancini, for instance, and I suppose it ends. Referring back to the Mike uh, Joe Hart conversation, like there is a degree where in that initial chat, they're saying, man, net him. He was so good. He was so young. Ugh, it should have worked out for him. It should have been better, etc." How do you feel? And I'm not, I'm not, by the way, ignoring the subsequent years of your uh, yeah. career here at all. But just if we, you take that Man City experience, does it, does a nagging sense I get reading the book that, ooh, things could have been different? Um, they could have been. I think in the first few years, I could have been healthier for longer because my understanding of what it was to be a professional footballer and an athlete didn't kick in until after Mark Hughes came. And from that point, I ended up playing a lot of football through those years, like the vast majority of my football, like, there was one season for QPR, for example, where I played in every minute of every game and did every training session. Right. That's abnormal. That's not a normal situation to be in. So I'm playing at least three quarters of most of the game of three quarters of the games I'm playing in for the last five, six years of my career. You know, that's that's something which I'm immensely proud of. But earlier, I wasn't really that. I didn't understand the importance of nutrition, stretching, you know, the mobility stuff before training, stuff after training. And, you know, you get to where you are. And everyone has like loose regrets, but then I wouldn't be the person I am if I didn't have those experiences. So I learned about it all. And I learned, and I was lucky because I learned about being a professional through Mark Hughes, but then all through also the players that won that league title in 2012, these guys were coming in extra early. They were leaving extra late because they were doing more. And I saw what like a really good professional, successful professional looks like. And that's what I strive to be from that point. You know, they were inspirational to me, whether it's Johnny Lescott, you come from Everton or whether it was like a David Silva or, you know, a Carlos Tevez, like they were relentless in their pursuit for individual and collective success. So I regret not necessarily understanding some of, those, some of those things earlier, but unfortunately that's just the way that it is. I've played like 400 odd games. That's a lot of football across 16 years. That's a lot of years. And when I look now and see like, some of these youngsters who are coming through 17, 18, 19 years of age, I say, oh, so cool. You know, they've got a chance to be great. But there's no guarantee that in 10 years' time, 12 years' time, they'll still be playing. So 16 years is a mile above average. And I think I played just under 200 games in the Premier League, which doesn't feel like a lot. And so you realise there are only 38 games in a season. And not every team is going to have the opportunity to be able to play all those games. And no player is going to be able to as well. So there is a sense of I could have done more. But then in the same breath, like, this is the nature of football. And Roberto turning up, whether I was healthy and played 300 games beforehand, likely it is, I was still going to be having his support. But, like, the support, like I said, he was never really behind me. He was behind me as he pushed me, like, just off the bridge into the into the water. Like, that's when he was distinctly <laughs> behind me. <laughs> Fully behind you then. Yes, he was, um, yeah. That city group you came through, like, there's some Irish talent there. Will a flood, I mean, yes. kind of burst on the scene. I remember that man of the match in Monday Night Football. It might have been against Norwich, I think. Um but the mm. other one I wanted to ask you about, because there's, well, I don't, I was about to say there's a real sense in Irish football, but certainly I have it. Because I remember, for whatever reason, I was I was uh, watching City closely at that time. And, and when Stevie Ireland came through, uh, he made such an impact. He was the type of player that Ireland don't produce all that often. He could knit yep. things together. The yep. man could play one-touch football and open out again. I mean, you, well, uh, you can tell me more, obviously, yep. having first-hand experience. But he was the type of player we don't produce and still don't produce all yeah. that often. And in the year before Mancini arrived, even amidst all those names we mentioned earlier who are coming to the club, the player of the year is Stephen Ireland. Ireland. Yeah. So you would have played youth football with him and you yeah. would have saw him up to and including the Mancini years. Yeah. Ugh, it does. It really does feel like Irish football lost out on what should have been a great decade with that guy. Yeah, I do agree. And to be honest, like, some of that is going to be down to Stevie's decision making. Like, look, I love Stevie Island. Like, I started playing with him when I was 13, 14 years of age. I'm now 35 and I'm still playing with him in these like five asides and stuff. And he's still unbelievable. Like, he's not played professionally for three years and he's unbelievable. He trains the same way he did whilst he was playing. So, when you say unbelievable, expand on that for us for a moment. Okay. So, I know every time I play and I'm on his team in a small sided game, or say in a first team game, if he plays well, there's a very good chance that we'll win. For me going out there, if I play well, then maybe we won't lose. But for him, 
it means there's a good chance he's going to win because the stuff that he does, whether it's the timing of passes, his vision, is sneakily very strong, sneakily very quick. His touch, like he sees a game that the vast majority of us don't see, and he can just be a part of it. And people can underestimate him. Like one of the one of my favorite games you ever played in was 2008 when we beat United at Old Trafford, and Steve was in and around the whole sort of area playing in the ten, and Real Ferdinand's very good at passing from the back. And Stevie read where he was trying to pass the ball out to probably 60, 70% of the time, to the point where Rio's now double, triple, quadruple guessing himself. And he's like a shell of himself, like a shell of a man. This is Rio Ferdinand at Old Trafford. And that's due to Stephen Island. You know, I thought this is because that's what he was. That's who he is. He, he knows where you're going to go, but you don't know what he's going to do. But he's going to do it. He's going to do it very well. Like Stevie's, the best way to describe him, I think, is Stevie's the difference. And like I say, it's a shame that it didn't work out from the Irish standpoint. And he, I think he'd probably look back at that time and probably would have made a few decisions differently as well, not to like really go too deep into it sure. all. But he's, he's, he was a fantastic player. And the crazy thing is like, he's still got those traits to this day. Because every time I go out, like if he, if we're playing, if these five sides are happening because he organizes them and he says he's not playing, I'm concerned. Because like, ah, we'll see how this goes. But if he's playing, can guarantee we're going to win because he's so good. Like yeah. Steve Island is the man. And you'd find if you ask anybody who's played with him, they'd say exactly the same. So even though he hasn't got the sort of games on the board and like significant stretches of playing week in, week out, four years in the Premier League, like he's still one of the best players people have ever seen. He'd have the respect because what, and yes. what he could do on the ball, first touch, two touch, or, or even take a bit more out of it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's Stevie, Stevie Island, like, and also there'll be some people listening who'll be moaning and groaning and so on and so forth. But like, I guarantee you, like next time Stevie's back in Ireland, challenge him for a game and see how that goes. And you'll know exactly what time it is, my friend. You know exactly what time it is. Because, I mean, he, you found it very difficult when you were out in the cold with uh, Mancini. Yeah. Uh, Stephen Ireland couldn't cope with that. And uh, again, you kind of wonder though, did nobody say to Roberto, I'm just saying, this guy was like a player of the year last year. He's, he's bloody, if, if you can get the best out of him, promise you he'll be worth it. Nah. At that point, like everybody's replaceable. And that's the crazy thing about it. The history that you have with the club didn't matter because Roberto was trying to plot the future. And I think if you saw Stevie at his absolute best, I think he maybe would have liked him more. But then Roberto also likes a sense of rigidity. Like when we did the team shape and stuff in training, when you received the ball, you had two options. You had to, you could either played it here or played it there. That's all it was. And the next person then played it either here or there. And we did it every single day. And if you didn't play it here or there, he stops the whole session and he'll restart it again. We'll do this again. We'll do this again. We'll do this again. So when you think about somebody as creative as Stevie Island mm. and the sort of fluidity, which you might have in terms of moving around positions and like, and even still like, annoyingly, Stevie Island would do better in this year for City because there is more a level of fluidity, especially amongst the front line. But then for Roberto, he wanted like, if you played right back, you say you get the ball from the right centre back, you'd give it to the defensive midfielder. And he said, you just run forward. He said, just go, go, go. And then centre the, sorry, I'm giving too much away here. Let's not watch this out. Watch out for this next time they're playing. So the right back goes to the defensive midfielder who then plays it to the right winger, for example. The, the One of the nines drops in to set the ball, to get the set from the right winger, who then plays it down the channel for the right back to get across in and the first nine makes the first run. The left winger gets in at the back post and the other nine comes in at the, the, the 12-yard spot. Like, that's Mancini's wet dream. That He loved that with a passion. Like, that's his thing. When the ball, when that goes into the goal there, like, oh, mate, it's an incredible scene. But that's that's his bag. That's who he is. So Stevie in that, like, who is he? Yeah. Who would he be in that setup? Oh, he's just another, he's a faceless cog. And exactly. so when you watch Italy now, do you see those patterns? I see certain patterns, yeah, not to the yeah. same extent because at times, you know, they'll play for a three at the back and so on. And, you know, in Italian football culture is very, like, it's been tactical for years, more yeah. so than saying that football had been. But he's very specific. Like, certain things have to happen. Certain things have to be done a certain way. Like, even when somebody looks like they're about to do a long ball, all four defenders come narrow and you all just run back, doing this particular run back as well, where your shoulders are open this way. Like, it's so detailed. And... Unfortunately, lots of creative players wouldn't fit in within that. Yeah. So that's that's a shame. But this Italian team, you know, the European champions, just a shame they can't be world champions this year as well. 
I don't want to take up too much more of your time and we've spent too long already. So I'm going to ask some uh, unfairly uh, short questions about broad yeah, jumps of your course, career. Yeah. Of QPR course. 2012 to 2018, again, experiences of Harry Redknapp, which are kind of disappointing in comparison with what, you, what I might have thought. And then big characters like Ian Holloway and yeah. uh, QPR at that stage is a bit of a roller coaster. On the whole, did you enjoy that period of your career, the, being that senior player and, and, and being fit for one thing? Yeah, I enjoyed it more so in the final three years when I was captain. I think the years before that, when it was more of an up and down, being in, being out. Like we had Joseph, Joseph Singwell playing a lot of games ahead of me in that second season after I'd played and we'd stayed up. Then Harry came in. Harry didn't understand me as a person, felt like he wasn't really having me for that first season of the Premier League. Then the championship year, like I was one of the players of the season, I believe. So um, looking back, like I appreciate this experience overall because it was hard there were long stretches in that which were very very hard because we were losing a lot of games and I was a long way from home but I played I think 220 something games for them of which a lot of those were in the Premier League as well and I was mm. captain for three years so realistically like I look back and I'm very fond of that because some people don't play that many games in their entire career yet still was able to do that as captain and some of my best memories of football came whilst playing for QPR at Loftus Road. So bit, I look, bit of vindication after the city exit as well, maybe? Nah, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that because it was a totally different experience. Because in a time like I say to people in Manchester, like, you know, all city needed to be successful was for me to leave, you know, because that's essentially what happened. <laughs> so I wouldn't say vindication because I still believe that I left QPR. I left for QPR in the Premier League. Then I ended up spending three years, possibly four, in the championship with QPR. And I still, I was adamant for all those years that I was a Premier League player because that's what I'd done before. And I was more experienced in the Premier League than in the Championship. So it wasn't vindication because I ended up not playing in the Premier League again after I left, after QPR went down the second time. So mm -hmm. it was a chance to play, but not necessarily the level I thought that I was. Fair enough. Uh, do you know what you're going to do with the next 36 years? I'm going to try and do um, as little work as possible because I'm very privileged to have looked after the money and stuff that I made because as we see in the book like I've been saving 80 pound a week at a time for a lot of years now so you know just purely off interest alone you know I'm flying so um <laughs> That's, I'm, what an amazing thing to be able to say in your mid-30s by the way I, I, yeah it's, it's incredible but I think this is different between my, myself and lots of other players like football is their identity whereas for me it never has been it's been mm -hmm. something I do if I introduce myself to someone I don't say I play football I just say I'm Nadeau Whereas a lot of people who say I'm such and such, I play football for this team in the Premier League and I'm important, but I've never cared about that. I will talk to anyone about football, but it's at their, it's because they want to talk about it as opposed to me. So in retirement, I do certain bits for media for the BBC. I've got ESPN and a few other uh, networks like that, but I do it as a hobby as, a, as opposed to a profession. And for me, the most important thing is just being able to enjoy life and create my own schedule because for 16, 18, 16 to 18 years, like, you'd be getting schedules at 11 o'clock at night saying you've got to be in at seven o'clock the next morning and you're going to travel to this place and say bye to your family because you're not going to see them for three, four days. But now mm. it's like, no, I'm going to see my family for three, four days. And then if I want to do media, I'll do it. So you'll probably see me occasionally on sort of, some sort of media platform every so often. Mm. But it's out of enjoyment, I suppose. As opposed exactly, to yeah. Obligation. Man, that's a yeah. great space to be in. Uh, mm -hmm. One last point, throughout the book, you talk about the experience and you were, I think you were of that generation. Gary Neville's has spoken recently about, uh, I don't want to misquote him here or be too harsh, but certainly his uh, regret, certainly his regret at not doing more as a fellow player when uh, those around him were subject to racism yeah. from the stands and, and yeah. thinking like, why did we not talk about that in the dressing room? Why, what, what the hell was going on in comparison with now where thankfully, whilst the situation is not perfect, you feel at least uh, there is a, a an attempt at a genuine reaction. Whereas I, back in your day, Serbian fans abusing you, Joe yeah. Hart right beside you. Yeah. It's like there was a degree of paralysis about not quite knowing what to yeah. do or how to handle this situation. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think, um, thankfully, things have improved since then. They're, they're a long way from being perfect. But sure. I think some of that improvement's come through, say, the internet and social media, because now we're a lot more connected to things other than just what we see in our cities and stuff like that so people look at what happened with george floyd and how it affected the world yeah. it didn't just affect the people within that state or the people within that country it affected everybody so now when you see all forms of like abuse and it's being covered globally like you have to make those decisions about whether you think this is okay or you don't and then when it happens or if it happens in your vicinity 
you have a different reaction because it's not the first time you've seen it and you know ways that people have tried to deal with it elsewhere and it's a significant news story as opposed to just sweeping it to the side because it mm. doesn't matter like it it's always mattered but it's never been covered but now it's being covered you realize the depth of it all and for them you know they wouldn't have thought like look Liverpool with the Suarez thing against Patrice Evra a little from when he said something which was like you know I understand the colloquial nature of what he said but he's not in his country saying it so for Liverpool to show support to Suarez at that point players and all that like that's insane but mm. then I know that they wouldn't do that today no because they understand how wild it is um so we are understanding more and we're figuring things out more and as I say it's not perfect but dress rooms are far better better places overall than they were back then where as a human being you couldn't show weakness and anyone being abused and like kind of felt like they had to deal with things themselves when the reality yeah. is they don't need to i think social media has been such an interesting development as well like i vividly remember last year tyrone mings taking on pretty patel with a tweet and suddenly yeah. players like ceos That's of their just, own companies yeah they, they've got like you maybe 10 15 years ago difficult thing to well, I don't know what you were supposed to do then, but it's easy to send a tweet and to bring it to attention to it that way as well. Yeah, you'd be basically, you could tend during our time when we were younger, like, what are you going to do? Put it on MySpace. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, there's not going to be anything there. And social media is a gift and a curse because that sort of platform that you can have can be used for a po in a positive manner to try and affect things. But then in the same breath, like the sense of anonymity that exists on there makes certain things worse as well. But it's good that, in some ways that what people say can dictate the news like him saying that pretty patel makes it news as opposed to all the times gone by and he, he knows what he's doing because he didn't need to tweet her he could have if he wanted to he could probably find a way to get a number and he could have sent her a message but instead this is it the people that support me believe this and now you have to address this because now it's in the open forum and that open forum nature of it at times can be a very big positive so listen a final thought you're uh you're you're very different I think to most footballers I chat on the show mm. uh for the next 35 40 years surely th that big old brain of yours you got to do something more with it than no just, uh, chill out you know don't be ridiculous you do my something friend. nah, nah I, like I enjoy I enjoy coming on shows like this where, which are thoughtful I enjoy being able to have an opinion but then also having the space to be able to explain it and then people can figure out who you are and what you stand for and they can like you or dislike you but at least they know where you're coming from so in terms of having an effect like that's where you'll find me. You find me in places where you can be more thoughtful instead of just like trying to find, like just trying to feed red, red meat to the, to the masses. Like, Oh, this is the worst. This, or this is the best that they are definitely going to do this. He is the worst. This like, all that stuff for me is like nonsense. I get that it's a product and people want it, but I'm not going to be a part of that. So I'm going to continue to be as analytical as I can be about myself, the game of football, but then also the key thing with my knowledge base and so on. He's trying to depict football in a more realistic manner because, you know, we love Gary Neville, we love Jamie Carragher and stuff like that, but they've only played for Man United and Liverpool, who are two of the biggest clubs in the world. So how about everybody else? What is it really, what's it really like to support one of those teams? What's it like to play for one of those teams? And myself and lots of others, I'm sure we're going to be doing our best to sort of depict football in a way whereby every time we speak, people learn about the game. And I think when you learn about it, you'll love it even more. Well, listen, thank you so much for the time. I'll hold the book up again. And ah, it's called Kicking Back. There you are, Neda Manua. It's such a pleasure talking to you. People, I'm sure, will get a lot out of this book. It's a, a different perspective, I suppose, on the rather strange world that is English football and beyond, and we haven't really scratched the surface. So thank you so much for the time. Best of luck with the book, and, uh, well, enjoy whatever takes your fancy over the next while. Thank you very much.